Bolivian court has ruled to rescind the arrest warrant on the sedition of the terrorist charges against former President Evo Morales. Early voting continues in the United States as Baltimore voters line up outside polling stations for the first early voting day in Maryland. Kenya's Electoral Authority announced President Alpha Conde won a controversial third term following 10 days of violence in a disputed national election. From the headquarters of Telesur English in Havana, Cuba, this is from the south, I'm Laura Palmeiro. A Bolivian court has ruled to resign the arrest warrant on sedition and terrorism charges against former President Evo Morales, which was promoted by the de facto authorities following the coup in November last year. The president of the District Court of Justice of La Paz, Jorge Quino, made the announcement noting that the decision considered the de facto authorities violated fundamental rights of former President Evo Morales following the coup in November last year. The court's decision now allows the former President Evo to return to Bolivia and undertake his defense on the case. The court's ruling comes just one week after the landslide victory for the movement towards socialism candidate Luis Arce in Bolivia's general election held on October 18th. And former Bolivian President Evo Morales announced that social movements, trade unions and representatives for the movement towards socialism are holding meetings to set his return into Bolivia. Former President Evo Morales made the announcement celebrating his birthday this Monday. I was called by my parent company yesterday, the Unified Syndical Confederation of Rural Workers of Bolivia. They are holding meetings to decide when I return to Bolivia the region of the Tropic of Cochabamba, the six unions. They are asking me to return on November 11. Also this Monday, the member of the Board of Directors of the Colombian Education Workers' Union, Carlos Rivas, has denounced acts of intimidation against the organization's leaders while calling on Colombia government to guarantee the rights to social protests. They just sent me a funeral wreath in which it says, rest in peace but they also sent us 15 little liturgical books with the name of each of the executive of the Colombian Education Workers Union and that of the comrade Diogenes, president of the Unitary Central and a Syrian trying to intimidate us, to shut us up. It arrived in a cab to my residence. What they want is to shut us up, and they are not going to shut us up. We call on the national government. The national government is responsible for our lives. It has to guarantee us the right to life the right to protest, the right to social struggle within the social and the law framework. What is being done is an attempt on the life of the union leaders. For that reason, comrades, we call for solidarity and unity with the Colombian Education Workers Union. This is a warning to stay silent and we will not do it. At Venezuela's National Electoral Council authorities have announced the beginning of the phase one of an audit to the electoral register in the lead up to the country's parliamentary elections to take place on December 6. The process will be conducted from November 2nd until December 6th and aims at certifying the database on fingerprints of voters registered in the electoral roll in order to avoid the duplication of electoral registrations. Meanwhile, the process will count on technical and scientific procedures based on software and hardware certified by technicians representing the political organizations which are participating in the parliamentary elections. Meanwhile, the process is part of the efforts by Venezuelan authorities to guarantee the credibility and transparency of December 6 elections. This Monday, Costa Rican authorities took over pro tempore presidency of the United Nations Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean on the occasion of the Commission's 38th session. Cuban representatives handed over the pro temporary presidency during a virtual conference, noting that the advance of the implementation of the United Nations Sustainable Goals Agenda 2030 in the region, the boosting of the Caribbean and the strengthening of South-South cooperation were the main lines of war promoted by the country since 2018. 
Meanwhile, Costa Rican authorities highlighted that the regional political development and coordination, as well as the cooperation in human rights fields, will be one of the pillars of Costa Rica's pro temporary presidency. And Foreign Minister of Venezuela, Jorge Arreaza, analyzed the effects of COVID-19 pandemic has in the region. The pandemic has definitely had many consequences, yet it is said that it has been due to COVID-19 generating the worst of the economic crisis. In fact, the crisis was already there, the existing crisis. Between that, a crisis of the model and the COVID-19 show how much more it has proved his fault, is his structural element. We believe in that sense, as Executive Secretary Alicia Barcena said, we have to think of an insertion in the model, a profound change in the economic model, imposed on us, especially during the 20th century, the effects on growth, on employment, the effects on this economic crisis. COVID-19 definitely has to be a call to consciousness and political will. We have assumed this presidency with much enthusiasm, and we are committed to promote the mandate of this commission, taking into account the principles of international cooperation, solidarity, and promotion of the human rights without leaving anyone behind. Meanwhile, the United Nations Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean Executive Secretary Alicia Barcena presented several proposals for tackling hunger, poverty, and inequality in the region. The impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on Latin America and the Caribbean, and I quote, the cost of inequality in the region, have become unsustainable. The response requires finding a new balance between the state, the market, and society, and emphasizing transparency, achieving greater accountability, higher levels of inclusion, to consolidate democracy by strengthening the rule of law and protecting human rights. And we'll be right back after this a very short break, so don't go away. Welcome back to From the South. The United States Senate confirmed a federal judge, Amy Coney Barrett, to the Supreme Court on Monday, thus securing President Trump's nominee a week before Election Day. Judge Barrett is the third justice on the nine-number court to be nominated by President Trump, and her appointment by vote of 52 against 48 significantly shifted over the court's ideological balance towards 63 conservative majority. Speaking at her confirmation hearings before the U.S. Senate, Judge Barrett presented herself as a neutral arbiter about the writings against abortion and a ruling on the Affordable Care Act. Better known as Obamacare, show a deeply conservative advocate. Meanwhile, Democrats argued that Barrett's nomination was being improperly rushed and insisted it should be up to winner of November 3rd election to name the nominee. Meanwhile, according to information provided by the Senate Historical Office, no other Supreme Court justice has been confirmed on a recorded vote with no support from the minority party in at least 150 years. Early voting continues in the United States as Baltimore voters line up outside polling stations for the first early voting day in Maryland. With the first day early voting turnout, plus the mail-in ballots cut so far, 1.1 million Marylanders have voted so far. Maryland officials have encouraged voters to take advantage of mail-in ballots to avoid the crowding at voting centers amid the COVID-19 pandemic. Meanwhile, in Pittsburgh, residents took part in early voting by filling in and dropping off mail-in ballots at their local elections office in the state of Pennsylvania. I did not want to leave any room for error. I wanted to make sure that my ballot actually made it in. Uh, we had been having some issues with uh, the U.S. Postal Service, so it was important for me to come in in person. Given that we're a swing state and may end up being the most consequential state, it's, it's even more important that, that Pennsylvanians come out uh, to vote. And, and, and the fact that we have such a low uh, polling percentage as a country is, is very embarrassing. 
With eight days before the presidential elections in the United States, citizens are beginning to wonder what will happen to the conflict in Yemen. Telesur's collaborator Dana Kakatovich shares her input in the matter. This will be my first time voting in a presidential election. One issue I'm concerned with as a young voter is whether or not the president-elect will call for an end to U.S. support for the war in Yemen. Since 2015, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates have been waging war on the people of Yemen with military backing from the United States. The Yemeni people deserve to decide how to run their own country without Saudi interference and definitely without American influence. As direct result of the war, over 15 million people are facing acute food insecurity, and Yemen experienced the largest cholera outbreak of modern history. Yemen is also experiencing one of the highest death rates from the coronavirus. One often overlooked aspect of the war is the Saudi blockade on the country. This blockade is being used to starve Yemen as a weapon of war. Democrats and Republicans in Congress passed a resolution to stop U.S. involvement in this war, and President Trump used his second veto of his presidency on it. Trump says he wants to end endless wars, but has decided to stay involved in this war over and over again. In a statement on Democratic candidate Joe Biden's campaign website, he said he would support an end to U.S. support for the war. But U.S. involvement in the war started while Biden was vice president, and he does not have a great track record regarding peace and justice. Activists are asking both candidates if they will reinstate all aid that was cut off to Yemen at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, if they will promise to help lift the blockade on the country, and if they will commit to ending all U.S. military participation in the war, um, including arms sales, logistics support, and intelligence sharing. We hope whoever is elected president will bring you many activists who have dedicated their time to stop U.S.-sponsored violence to the table. This is Danica Katowicz from Code Bank, reporting from Chicago, Illinois. World Health Organization officials have noted that the Europe region is an epicenter of the novel coronavirus. Meanwhile, the total number of confirmed COVID-19 cases stands now at over 8.6 million and more than 200,000 related deaths. 46% of all the global cases in the world were from our, what our European region is not. That <clears throat> obviously extends from Vladivostok to Reykjavik, so it's a, it's a larger uh, conceptual footprint than the European Union, um, and uh, about uh, uh, nearly uh, one third of global debt. So there's no question that the European region is an epicenter for disease right now, and as Maria said, though, that that's not consistent across the whole. Um, I, want to ask, uh... I think uh, we have to. Um, <clears throat> look at that uh, very seriously in the context of the European Union and the context of the region as a whole, there's a lot of free movement. Uh, and therefore, uh, on those principles, uh, it may require uh, shutting down um, and restricting movement and having stay-at-home orders in order to take the heat out of this phase of the pandemic. On Monday, authorities in Bosnia and Herzegovina have ordered the mandatory use of face masks in doors places across the country in the move to curb a recent increase in the novel coronavirus cases. Health authorities have reported over 41,000 COVID-19 confirmed cases and more than 1,000 related fatalities since the outbreak of the epidemic in the country. It's important to say that the incidence of infection is now 160 per 100,000 population and it's double from just a week ago. We have a rapid rise in the number of patients, so we have been forced to introduce some new orders. Mainly face masks have to be mandatory outdoors, everywhere in the territory of the Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina. We have ordered all medical facilities in the country, all of them, local hospitals, general hospitals, clinics, everyone. They all have to open up facilities to receive COVID-19 patients. 30% of their capacity must be devoted to COVID-19 patients. On Monday, Spanish authorities are warned of the alarming health situation in the country. If new COVID-19 cases tallies continue to increase during the coming weeks, 
Meanwhile, over 52,000 new novel coronavirus cases and 279 related deaths were reported in the country since Friday last week. The truth is that the evolution of infections is very quick, very clearly upwards. It is very likely that if we don't manage to implement all the measures correctly, this transmission will continue to increment at least during the coming weeks. What we can do is to see how the pandemic evolves. If it continues to increase during the coming weeks, it's possible that in the middle or third week of November, I wouldn't say we will be in a situation of collapse, but in a very critical situation in our ICU units and also in general hospitalization. Not so much because we can't handle the burden of the coronavirus, but because we will have to limit the normal functioning of hospitals, not sure in what percentage, but to reduce a great deal of the scheduled activities of the hospitals. No tanto porque no se puede asumir. Following the release of a new report by the United Nations Environment Program, United Nations officials have noted that millions of used cars, vans and minibuses exported from Europe to the United States and Japan to the developing world are contributing significantly to the air pollution and hindering efforts to mitigate the impacts of climate change. The report shows that between 2015 and 2018, 14 million used vehicles were exported worldwide. Eight, some 80 percent of those went to low- and middle-income countries, with more than half going to Africa. UNEP said developed countries must stop exporting vehicles that fail in environmental and safety inspections and are no longer considered roadworthy in their own countries. The report also calls for the adoption of minimum quality standards that will ensure that used vehicles contribute to cleaner, safer in importing countries. And we'll take a final short break now, so stay with us. Welcome back to From the South. After Guinea's electoral authority announced that President Alpha Conte won a controversial third term following 10 days of violence, in the disputed national election, supporters of his main opponent, Salo Dalain Diallo, have said they reject the provisional results. Kenya's President Alpha Conde won a disputed national election, the country's electoral authority said on Saturday, setting the stage for a controversial third term. The announcement followed days of violence in which around 10 people were killed in clashes over Conde's re-election, leading the West African nation of some 13 million people. Hundreds of people in northern Syria staged a protest against France President Emmanuel Macron on Monday over caricatures of Prophet Muhammad. Protesters in Ladabab raised protests posters with pictures of French president with his face stamped with a shoe. Some protesters step on Macron posters, while others called him Muslims leaders to boycott the French products. Muslims in the Middle East and beyond broadened their calls for boycotts on French products and protests as a clash over depictions and the Prophet Muhammad and the limits of free speech intensified. Macron has vigorously defended them on the basis of the right to free speech. The growing confrontation is raising political tensions between France and some Muslim-majority nations. We all in the liberated areas heard the anti-Islamic statements by the French President Macron, statements that are repeated continuously from the head of state. These statements are like the rockets fired upon us by Russia and the regime. Today we came out in an angry demonstration in support of our beloved prophet denouncing Macron's statesman and the French attitude towards the head of our rituals and the symbols of Islam. French Foreign Minister on Monday met with members of Mali's transitional government in Bamako in a move to reinforce the need for cooperation between Europe and the West African state. 
Adrian held talks with his counterpart, Saini Mulaye, as well as the president of the transitional government, Banda, and Vice President Asimi Goita. After signing agreements of cooperation in different areas, the French foreign minister welcomed the advances made by the authorities during the transitional process. He stressed the importance of organizing new elections, the fight against impunity and terrorism. On Monday, Kenyan President Uhuru Kenyatta and the leader of the opposition, Raila Amoyo Odinga, presented the Building Bridges Initiative Task Force report aimed at the amend of the current constitution in order to curb divisive politics and election violence risk in the country. A document that has been worked on and again, I repeat, for a period now of two years and a document whose objective is really nothing more than to find what ails our country find what ails our country and hopefully give us that will heal our country we agreed that it was time to look at some of the issues ailing our country because in spite of having passed this constitution, which has been hailed all over the world as one of the most democratic constitutions, still we have a problem as a people. So what is it that is missing that needs to be fixed so that Kenyans can march on as a people who are proud and who are happy? And following a meeting with his Greek counterpart on Monday, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov called on Greek and Turkish authorities to resolve the territorial dispute in the southern Mediterranean Sea through direct dialogue. There are many problems, new problems, which are well known. In addition to those issues which already exist in the southern part of the Mediterranean Sea, all of these have to be resolved in accordance with international law. Regardless of the difficult situation, in particular between Turkey and Greece, we are interested in these problems being discussed and resolved through direct dialogue. Just yesterday, Turkey renewed for the umpteenth time its willingness to conduct illegal seismic surveys in areas of the Greek continental shelf. It is obvious that Turkey is investing in escalating tensions. It proves on a daily basis that, apart from violating international law, it disregards the appeals of friends and partners, and its words lack credibility. I made it clear that Greece is ready for all contingencies and has no choice but to defend its sovereignty and its sovereign rights. Finally, I indicated that we are always committed to constructive dialogue, but at the same time, there is no room for dialogue under a state of pressure and threats. And we have come to the end of this news brief. Remember, you can find these and many other stories on our website at telesurenglish.net. Remember to join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. For Telesur English, I'm Laura Palmeiro. Thank you for watching.